Good afternoon and uh, welcome again uh, to a, uh, an afternoon interview. Um, uh, this is part of uh, our ongoing uh, program on um, uh, democracy and the rule of law. Uh, this afternoon we're very happy to have with us uh, Mrs. Fanula Argiru, uh, a journalist and researcher based in London. Uh, uh, we also have uh, Dr. Klerkos uh, Kiriagiris, uh, who heads up uh, our uh, Democracy and Rule of Law uh, program. Uh, before we start, uh, the, the uh, topic to tonight is uh, long-term uh, Turkish strategy on Cyprus, as recorded uh, in the British National Archives. Um, uh, as researched by Mrs. Fanoudar Yiru. Uh, before we start, uh, I need to remind you uh, that the views expressed uh, tonight are the views, are the personal views uh, of the discussants. Um, Mrs. Yiru, um, people in Cyprus know you from the interesting uh, revelations you bring from studying the British archives. Uh, aren't such archives, archives, however, censored, at least as far as the really interesting parts? Uh, uh, isn't there a chance of being misled by the material? First of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, and I will answer your question. Um, the National Archives, the British National Archives, have a uniqueness. They have a continuation. Uh, they, are, uh, they, they do not mislead unless you want to be misled yourself, and I explain why. If you do not research the documents, say, if you go to the archives today and you pull out an ar a file of 1985, and you haven't read what was written in 1984, uh, you'll probably be misled. Uh, in that, uh, uh, you have to be very careful into uh, researching and knowing uh, the continuation of the documents because the British uh, foreign policy is consistent, has a continuation, is a state policy, uh, and is based on, the, uh, on safeguarding the British uh, interest. Uh, we are talking about different uh, <coughs> departments, Foreign Office, Ministry of Defense, Cabinet files, Prime Minister's files, Home Office, intelligence, uh, and every aspect of uh, political and military and whatever uh, is involved in, uh, in, in everyday uh, governance in, in, uh, in Britain. So I don't believe they misled, if you know how to research. Uh, but after all, uh, this, you're identifying uh, the, the views of several individuals uh, in the British Foreign Office or Commonwealth Office or where else. Uh, how confident are you that, first of all, their evaluations are correct, uh, and, and secondly, that, that you have a full picture of their evaluation. Um, in answering this, I should say that uh, the, the documents that are censored uh, are estimated to be roughly 1%. So the rest of the documents are there. And uh, as I said before, if, if you research and, and you study the documents carefully, um, they give you the, 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 the very right picture. As far as the Turkish policy is concerned, uh, I believe uh, Turkish uh, uh, track record speaks for itself. And uh, the documents that are there are confirmed by every day, year by year, every day, uh, actions of Turkey. And uh, the documents are 100% correct in their description of Turkish policy. And what is their description of Turkish policy as far as Cyprus is concerned? A lot. Uh, for instance, we can start from 1955, uh, when uh, Britain, uh, with the tri tripartite conference, brought in Turkey. Turkey decided, uh, uh, embarked on a policy of uh, re uh, recapturing Cyprus. And that was the title of the uh, constitutionalist, Dr. Nihad Erim, who was commissioned uh, by uh, Prime Minister Menderes, the Turkish Prime Minister at the time, to prepare a plan uh, how to recapture Cyprus. Uh, ever since, 
that policy has been uh, carried to the letter to this very day. And to this I will, uh, I will confirm you this uh, opinion of mine, which is uh, held by many. In, uh, February, in uh, uh, 2014, there was a, a, a study by a Turkish uh, um, Hikmet Ceki Kapsi in the Journal of Modern Turkish History Studies titled the uh, Nihaderim Report for the Solution of Cyprus Problem. The result of this uh, study, uh, according to the Turkish uh, uh, writer, said, after the Tripartite Conference in London in 1955, Turkey changed policy and decided uh, and, and asked for the partition of Cyprus. That report was given to the Turkish Prime Minister on the 24th of November 1956, and it is estimated that Turkey has been following that report of Nihat Erim to this very day. Now, we go back to 1955. And following that, in 1956, um, there's, there have been a lot of exchanges between the British and the Turkish uh, governments. <clears throat> and in November 56, a delegation headed by the Prime Minister uh, Menderes came to London and they had talks with uh, the British uh, government. At the same time, the British government had appointed Lord Ratcliffe to prepare constitutional proposals for Cyprus. On the 16th of December 1956, the then colonial secretary went to Turkey and had a, a, a very uh, secret and uh, important, historically important meeting with the Turkish prime minister in Constantinople, where it was agreed uh, that uh, the whole uh, policy of Turkey uh, was in fact uh, concentrated in one statement, which was uh, read by the British uh, uh, colonial secretary three days later, on the 19th of December 1956. And I will read it. This is the statement read by the colonial, colonial Sec secretary of the United Kingdom yes. in the House of Commons yes. on the 19th It was of when December they, they officiated the uh, uh, Radcliffe proposals. And at the same time, this was a promise given to the Turkish Prime Minister. And in fact, the most important uh, element is that uh, Menderes actually dictated that uh, statement to uh, the British uh, colonial office uh, secretary. And it read, when the international and strategic situation permits and when self-government is working satisfactorily, her Majesty's government would be ready to review the question of the application of self-determination. When the time comes for this review, that is when the conditions have been fulfilled, it will be the purpose of Her Majesty's government to ensure that any exercise of self-determination will be effected in such a manner that the Turkish Cypriot community, no less than the Greek Cypriot community, shall have freedom to decide for themselves their future status. This would mean that in the event of the exercise of self-determination resulting in a choice in favor of a change of the international status of the island, then the Turkish Cypriots would be given the option of electing for partition. That was the promise for self-determination to a minority of 18%. And the Turks, after that, they put you know, forward their full demands on Cyprus. Just to, just to jump in, if I may. Yeah. So what you're saying, Fanula, is that the, the statement delivered by Alan Lennox Boyd on the floor of the House of Commons was primarily based upon guidance given to him by the Turkish government yes. in talks prior yes. to the delivery of that yeah. statement. Yeah. This, this, this begs the following question. A lot of people in Cyprus, again, have a feeling or uh, the, I guess, uh, uh, inkling that the British were behind uh, uh, stirring up uh, Turkish interests for Cyprus. What now, it, it, is, is that true? Or, I mean, I, I can't uh, uh, envision that a country as large as Turkey 
uh, would not have a latent policy on Cyprus. Now, whether they brought it to, to the surface and when they brought it to the surface, that's a different question. But, but I think the impression here is that Turkey had written Cyprus off, uh, but for uh, British uh, uh, pre uh, uh, pressure uh, sometime after the uh, 55, 56 in that period, and that was what brought the Turks back into the picture. Is that correct, or is that a, a misunderstanding of the fact? No, it's roughly correct. It's roughly correct because we have uh, evidence uh, that uh, in 1955, uh, for instance, the British were uh, asking or advising the Turks to uh, start uh, bringing in the rights of the Turkish Cypriots. And uh, we have one reference, for instance, that says this hasn't happened yet. Now you have to wake up and do it. Uh, and, and even so, it, it, it goes on to say that if you don't know how to do it, you should employ public relations companies to do it for you. That's one reference that there is there. But the Turks, uh, the, the, the Turks always had Cyprus in mind. Uh, and uh, they didn't want it to go to Greek hands if the British left. That's good. Yeah, so, um, but it was with the help of the British Foreign Office and Sir Ivor Kirkpatrick, one of their officials, who uh, actually he, he, he admitted that it, he was the first one to air the uh, idea of partition. And, uh, Which is in 56. 55. 55. 55. And uh, he was the, the, he, he was the, uh, the person who initiated the tripartite conference uh, to bring in Turkey. Uh, and uh, from there on, uh, the Turks uh, carried on, uh, you know, uh, they carried on their plans. And that's, uh, uh, that's how they, um, they, they, they had the Lihaderi report. And after the 19th uh, of December, 19, uh, the 19th of December 56 statement, when they secured the promise and the pledge for partition, uh, early 1957, they, they moved on. And they said, you know, we don't want partition now. We want federation. And uh, they, they explained that they wanted two zones. And that's how the bizonal, bicommunal federation was evolved. It was in 1957, having had the partition pledge, they moved on to federation. And they said, no, we want federation. And not even the British could believe that they could achieve it. Yeah, yeah I'm just just to re I just wanted to reinforce a point here. What the British documents reveal, and, and I've had the privilege of, of looking at uh, some of them as well uh, in my, my studies in the past, what the British documents reveal is that in this critical period from 1955 to 1966, the Turks in tandem with the British developed the idea that the people of Cyprus should be subdivided strictly into Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. Yeah. And on the other hand, the territory of Cyprus could, in certain circumstances, be partitioned into Greek and Turkish zones. So when one talks about partition, it's important to bear in mind that there are two types of partition at play here. There's the constitutional and demographic partition. Greek Cypriots in one camp, Turkish Cypriots in the other camp, and a territorial partition yeah. with a Turkish zone yeah. on one side of the island and a Turkish zone on the other side, with two British zones as yeah. well in the yeah. south. So I think that's the importance of 55, 56. It's the origins of the idea yeah. of two communities and two zones. And I, I'd, I'd like both of you to know, what is presented is that federation or the move towards federation is a compromise on the part of Turkey that originally wanted partition and now is settling for a constitutional uh, arrangement, settlement, if you will, that has elements of bizonality and so on. Is, is this what it is? I mean, or am I hearing uh, something else? Is that, yeah. in fact, federation is an advancement on the partition demands. Yeah, in, in other the words, beginning, it's, a, it's yeah. a more yeah. uh, a, 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 a progressive a, progr a progression rather yeah. than a regression. Yeah, uh, originally 1955 at the tripartite conference, uh, at the then foreign secretary Zorlu, Fazl Zorlu, uh, Fatem Zorlu, he 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 said that partition was a sacrifice 
for Turkey because they wanted the whole of Cyprus. But it was sacrificed if, if he, they had half of it. Now, after having that pledge, as I said, and they moved on and they decided to go for two zones and federation, the British said, but this is not federation, this is confederation. And if one decides to abandon uh, the, the federation, then the federation breaks, you know. Anyway, they carried on and uh, gradually uh, they saw the, uh, in the meantime, there were a lot of plans, for partition plans prepared by the British and different lines and this and that. Uh, but the Turks then, they carried on on federation. And uh, they knew because with federation, they could control both sides of Cyprus. With partition, they would only have one. So uh, they were very clever in uh, progressive, progressing step by step and gaining step by step and holding on to that gain to this very day. And uh, we, we find in mid-1957, studies for federation started being prepared in the foreign office in, as well as studies for partition as well as studies for partition and uh, we come to january 58 when they, they started really talking about federation with nihad Erim in london uh, demanding a lot of things but because at the time the americans and nato and the uh, world public opinion wouldn't accept partition of Cyprus at the time when the colonies were uh, being liberated and taking, having independence and everything, uh, the British steered the, the, uh, the Turks into accepting um, the independence of Cyprus eventually, uh, but consenting to uh, evolving constitutional devices. And Nihad Erim was a clever man. so. Uh, not being able to achieve in full what they wanted, he consented to that, and that's why uh, he imposed a lot of the uh, a lot of uh, the, the articles and uh, a lot of elements in the Zurich Constitution are based on Nihad Erim's demands, and um, that's how they 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 accepted the London and Zurich agreements with the knowledge both the British and the Turks that it wouldn't last, it would soon break. And they were estimating three to four years. Just a, just a recap, as the 1950s unfolded, or the early 1950s unfolded, Turkish strategy was based on either preserving the British rule on the island or recovering the yes. island. Yes. And it was in that context that we had the Tur Cyprus's Turkish movement yes. evolve. They then, from 1955 onwards, um, came into the picture diplomatically with the tripartite conference, yes. in which the British and Greece, one might add, uh, effectively acknowledged that Turkey had a stake in the future of Cyprus in spite of the Treaty of Lausanne. Mm -hmm. And then in 1956, we have the emergence of the idea of partition and the carve up of the island into two communities and two zones. So partition was a compromise to total control which in fact the federation is this what you're saying what i'm saying the, the is the federation has more to do with the total control yes. than, with, than, than as a retreat from partition well i'm going to defer to uh, fanula's uh, expertise on the emergence of federation but what i will say at this point is it's terribly important to understand the essence of turkish strategy fanula put her finger on it earlier turkish strategy originally sought to recapture the whole of cyprus uh, I have in front of me here a statement given by Prime Minister Harold Macmillan on the floor of the House of Commons on the 26th of the June 1958, in which he said, Mr. Macmillan, the Turks, I am putting their view, Mr. Macmillan said, the Turks regard Cyprus as an extension of the Anatolian plain, a kind of offshore island with vital significance for their defence and their security. They say, the Turks say, this has been their argument up to now, that the Turkish Cypriot community must not be ruled by a Greek Cypriot community, and they have advocated the physical separation of the two communities by means of a territorial partition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the importance of this period, and this is why we're dwelling on it, the importance of this period from 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, is that it gives us the historical foundation Except. for what we are seeing today, which is the attempt to cement and to purportedly legitimize the 
uh, constitutional division of Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots and the territorial division of Cyprus into a Greek zone and a Turkish zone. I can add to this. Uh, in order to separate and segregate the two communities and to advance the federation uh, idea, uh, we find that uh, on um, 15th of March 1957, it was uh, recorded in the Foreign Office, from the Foreign Office to the Colonial Office, that uh, the Turks demanded that the word minority covering the Turkish Cypriot be re replaced by the word community. So that is most important because they uh, actually separated the population of Cyprus into two communities. And we find that they insist on two communities, even if I just make a little parenthesis, in, on the 10th of August 1974 uh, at the Geneva Conference, uh, the Turkish foreign minister at the time, Gunes, he was asking for two autonomous uh, federal states, and he was underlining the fact only to communities. Mm. So I close the parenthesis there. And I can give you some more examples. For instance, in um, another point is that in uh, January and February 1958, uh, exchanges between the British and the Turks on the Federation and constitutional equality in Cyprus. It's written that uh, Prime Minister Menteres said that in his view, the following were the main points which needed clarification. And one of them was that the federal basis of the reg uh, regime in Cyprus, it should be in a form which gave equal rights to the Turkish and Greek communities mm. since then. and. Ironically, there is another uh, reference uh, on the 1st of January 1956, that six months after the tripartite conference, um, the, the Southern Department of the Foreign Office was quoting that if the Turks, if, they, if the British come to the point uh, and the, uh, the Turks, you know, uh, press them, they should tell them that in a democratic constitution, it's impossible to give equal rights uh, of voting to two communities with such a big difference in numbers. And what were those numbers? 18% and 82%, isn't it? Well, uh, but still, it was the same British government that consented to every single demand the Turks made. I have to make again a connection with the present. If we read the joint declaration that was issued by uh, Mr. Anastasiadis wearing his hat in inverted commas as the Greek Cypriot leader and uh, Dr. Uh, Eroglu, yes. the then uh, Turkish Cypriot leader, on the 11th of February 2014, yes. one sees 11. the following phrase. The objective of the settlement process is the formation of a bicommunal, bizonal federation consisting of two politically equal communities. So what Fanula has effectively told us is that the origins of that phrase, two politically equal communities, goes back to this period in the late 1950s. It's an integral part of Turkish strategy. Its objective is to undermine the principle of majoritarian democracy, to elevate the status of a minority into a community, and thereby set the scene for constitutional partition. There is, of course, a problem here because um, the, the Armenians, the Latins, the Maronites, and others who live on the island are compelled to be swept up into one of the two communities because the Turkish strategy rests on what I call the Turkish two peoples in one island thesis. They keep on saying there are two communities and only two communities, and they sometimes vary it by saying there are two peoples. So you are compressed, irrespective of your background. You can be Jewish, you can be Buddhist, you can be uh, Hindu. You compressed, compelled to go into one of those two communities. Which is not what happened in Lebanon, where you had at the end of the day constitutionally recognized, the constitution recognized 
what was it, 17, 18? 18, 18, I think it was. Yes. Uh, communities. So, uh, theoretically, it could have been done. Uh, but uh, there was a political reason, I guess, in Cyprus uh, not to do that. And this is what we're yes. seeing. Final, take us to the um, uh, Zurich-London Agreement. How did they uh, come about and what was their significance to the evolution of the concept of two communities and two zones? Well, they put the foundation, actually, for Turkey to continue its policy. And gradually, because of the veto of the Turkish Cypriots, uh, that veto, uh, uh, you know, um, safeguarded the unworkability of the, of the constitution. And uh, uh, a lot of elements uh, were uh, unworkable. Uh, for instance, 70 to 70 percent to 30 percent in the in the civil service. They did Turkish the Turkish uh, community or a minority. They didn't have so it's, many people. It's too to, small. It was too small to it's fill up all these uh, places. Uh, and the law, uh, and uh, Nihaderim was the. Uh, the instigator of uh, the separate uh, municipalities. That didn't work. Uh, and at the end, we find that Archbishop Makarios was compelled to, to draft those 13 point uh, report, you know, to try and make some changes and, and make it uh, workable. Well, that didn't work either. Uh, and uh, we see that the Turks continued their policy uh, of uh, demanding federation. Uh, they got prepared, they armed the Turkish Cypriots, they, um, the TMT and everything. And in uh, 19, December 1963, they, they, they attacked us. And that's how uh, we have at the end the uh, United Nations Security Council Resolution 186 in March, which uh, established the uh, peacekeeping force uh, United Nations in Cyprus. The Turks, uh, uh, they moved into their enclaves, and they stayed there until 1974. And that was according to the Turkish plan of uh, establishing uh, a foothold in Cyprus uh, with federation, uh, which, uh, which they did in 1974 with the invasion. But I go back to 1960, and, and in, um, in 1963, uh, after the events, in, uh, on the 16th of January 1964, the Britain convened a conference in London. And there, uh, Rauf Tehtash, the then Turkish Cypriot leader, demanded geographical separation, geographical federation, with uh, population exchanges, uh, with compensation, with people moving from one side to the other and being compensated uh, and for their uh, properties, uh, and they wanted uh, uh, a whole area for the northern area of Cyprus for themselves. That was mm. in, in line with the uh, uh, Turkish policy of federation, of two zones. Mm. Then in, uh, in, 90, in, in April, May of uh, June uh, of uh, 1964, again, the Turks, Turkish Cypriots continued to demand this, and they issued documents uh, for a federal Cyprus with a Greek Cypriot government and a Turkish Cypriot government. And that was, again, uh, a continuation of the, British, of the Turkish policy. And these are quite explicit in the British mm. documents. Can I just make a couple of observations yeah. here? So in this period from 1960 to 64, we see the emergence or the re-emergence or the evolution of the concept of two communities and two zones. Yeah. First of all, with the Zurich-London agreements yes. in the 1960 constitution, there was constitutional partition. Greek Cypriots were herded into the Greek community, which was defined with reference to Greek culture and the Greek Orthodox Church. Yeah. On the other side, the Turkish community uh, was uh, defined with reference to Turkish culture and Islam. So you had a, an ethno, as I call it, an ethno-religious constitutional partition in 1960. We, we always hear from some people in Cyprus, understandably, that the Cyprus question is purely a matter of invasion and occupation, and the partition is a product of the invasion and occupation. In my view, the Partition of Cyprus began in 1960 with the constitutional partition. And what happened in 1964 
63, 64, and in 74, was the staged territorial partition of Cyprus. So it's a, I just want the, 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 the viewers to appreciate this distinction between a constitutional partition on the one hand also, and a territorial partition on the other. Also, if, if Fanula would allow me, uh, I, I think there was uh, a certain degree of blame, though, uh, on our part, on our part, being the good part, because I think, um, I, I know that was not your intention, but, uh, you know, it, from what you said before, um, the suggestion is that uh, the, the Turkish side is really the ones that initiated the problems and, uh, you know, started the, this, uh, this unfortunate uh, uh, series of events. But, but uh, there was a tendency, and I, I, I remember I was a young person in those days, but uh, I do remember that it was with a sense of relief uh, on the Greek side uh, to see the Turkish Cypriots uh, leave the constitutional uh, or the institutions that were um, a part of the, the 1960 constitution. So, uh, you know, there, there was, I think, if not complicity, certainly uh, a certain degree of, uh, of, of uh, synergy uh, from our part. Uh, into what led to be the situation in 1964. Well, um, well, I, be, I believe it wasn't that much, but uh, uh, I can add uh, something else to what I said, is that in uh, uh, a document found in the office of the Turkish Cypriot Ministry of Agriculture, if I'm not wrong, Mr. Plumer, uh, you know, when uh, the, the events uh, took place in December 63, all the uh, Turkish Cypriots in the civil service were ordered to abandon their places and concentrate in the uh, Turkish uh, Cypriot enclave. Um, Mr. Blumer apparently left, uh, forgot that document for whatever reason in his office, and the authorities of the Republic found it. And that was signed 14 September 1963 and was signed by the Vice President, uh, Dr. Fazel Kuchuk, and the then uh, President of the Communal uh, Chamber, uh, Rauf Tektaj. Now, that document is quite a revelation uh, in, in detailing all the uh, uh, plans for uh, a, a takeover, uh, uh, say, um, to topple the, the Republic of Cyprus and create uh, two uh, federal states uh, in its place. Um, Mr. Benjamin, the ex-minister for interior, if you know, remember, uh, he wrote a book and he published the whole of that document uh, as an annex in, the, in his book. And I go back to 1964 and it's uh, a report from uh, uh, Major General Bishop, WHA Bishop, who, who, as you know, he was in the Commonwealth Relations Office and he was uh, appointed as an acting uh, High Commissioner here at the time for uh, for a few months. Here being only. made to see in Cyprus. Yes, only for a few months mm. uh, in, in putting aside uh, Arthur Clarke mm. uh, and they said he was ill or something. Anyway, and he said that the communal chamber the Turkish Communal Chamber published a pamphlet entitled Federation and the Cyprus Economy, which set out a claim to a state in North Cyprus, bounded by a line from Yala to Famagusta, Yala is in Paphos, uh, uh, to Famagusta, covering 37% of total area of Cyprus, and purported to prove that it would be feas feasible economically. Pamphlet was in fact full of the usual polemics, and muddled thinking and contained few, if any, valid economic arguments in favor of federation. And that was written by a man who was supporting, in actual fact, the Turkish uh, uh, positions. Because uh, back in the Foreign Office, following that uh, December 63 uh, events, uh, we find that the Foreign Office, uh, on the third of January 1964 had already started memorandums and plans for a federal Cyprus. 
this is very interesting, and I have to offer a comment here uh, with reference to democracy and the rule of law. In the liberal democratic tradition, we have the principle of equality under the law. Everybody is equal and treated equally under the law, irrespective of their race, religion, or other uh, background. Liberal democracy established. We had what was called a bicommunal partnership state, to use the jargon that Turkey enjoys using, with communal chambers and um, the allocation of places in government, not according to ability or qualifications or credibility, but according to whether one was a Greek or a Turk. Whether the, um, the quota of 70% or 30% needed to be reached, and in some cases it was a 60-40. Uh, ratio. So the, the whole system was built around the opposite of meritocracy and the opposite of equality. That's the first thing that I think people need to realise. And we're going to have a, a perpetuation of that if we have a bicommunal, bizonal federation. Because people will be appointed to positions in government or in parliament or in the judiciary, not necessarily because they're the best or because they're qualified, but because they happen to be a Greek Cypriot. Yeah or a Turkish Cypriot. And they have to fill a place. And they have to fill a place. The second thing that I wanted to comment on, on the importance of 1960, is that it established a bicommunal state. In other words, it was a constitution that was a product of bicommunalism. Now, I, I'm a, a law lecturer by profession, and I, always, I was taught, and I now teach my students, to search for the origins and the meaning of a particular word that is significant to us. And I've gone in search of the meaning of the word bicommunalism. And bicommunalism is a variation of communalism. What is communalism? The Oxford English Dictionary gives us the answer. Communalism refers to the organisation of society at the level of the community rather than the individual. Western liberal democracy rests on the individual. Communalism rests on the community. And the Oxford, Oxford Dictionary goes on to tell us that communalism has a tendency to engender strong allegiance to one's own ethnic or religious group rather than to a society or nation as a whole. It is also likely to engender religious factionism, factionalism and ethnocentrism. So the bloodshed and the destruction and the murders that took place in Cyprus from 1963 to 64 and, and afterwards which I condemn unreservedly, irrespective of who committed the, the murders. Those murders and that bloodshed and that intercommunal turmoil was a product of and a reflection of communalism. Which dates back to, to <laughs> a, a previous concept of the Maliet of the Ottoman yes. period. I, I mean, yeah. it's, it's interesting that you identify that it's not a Western concept, communalism is more an oriental concept. It's an oriental imperial uh, 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 method of uh, really? keeping peace among uh, ethnic groups uh, who are part of the empire or part of the dominion. Yeah. Uh, and yet uh, the British didn't use that, or did they? Uh, I mean, they used an adaptation of that in Cyprus. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but, uh, hid it under Western concepts. I mean, I, I think there's, there's communism masquerading as group rights, uh, where group rights are accepted in the Western concept, uh, especially in the United States, you have affirmative action. What is mm -hmm. it? You find that a group of your citizens are, uh, 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 are in a, in a weaker economic or other position, and you try to prove their lot. Uh, so you could sell that uh, on, a, on a Western conceptual basis, but, but not the real essence of communalism, which is exactly based on a perpetuation of racial, uh, ethnic, and religious differences. Yeah, this is what and this is what happened in Cyprus, and this is what distinguishes Cyprus from Belgium and Switzerland and the other consociational models that are often paraded as if Cyprus is similar to them. The difference is Cyprus has been constitutionally partitioned into Christians and Muslims, which is, in, in my view, unacceptable because I believe in integration and in equality and non-discrimination. 
And in Cyprus, bicommunalism serves a Turkish strategy. It doesn't serve the interests of democracy, it serves the interests of Turkey. But it was initially a Turkish uh, yeah. idea. I'm Can we go back to Fanula and ask her to uh, explain the, um, the development of the idea of, of bicommunal, bizonal federation in this period from 1964 to 74? So what happened in that period to... Uh, in, to enable us to understand how this idea of a bicommunal, bizonal federation well, evolved it's, and emerged. It's, it's very simple because after 74, when the Turkish Cypriots concentrated in their enclaves. So 64, you mean? After 64, 64 yes. Yeah, 64, they concentrated in their enclaves and they insisted in, in demanding federation. They never changed their policy. And we find year by year in the in the British documents that the, the, they refer to uh, the Turkish uh, the, the, the Turkish demand. For instance, we go to uh, 12 of January 1965. Uh, Prime Minister Inonu sends a four-page letter to uh, the British uh, Prime Minister, and at the same time he applies to the American uh, President, and he's asking for help to establish a federation in Cyprus in very clear terms. It's an official uh, letter uh, with the Prime Minister's uh, signature and everything. And we find that uh, in 1967, uh, the Turks in the occupied areas, in their enclaves, say, they even issue uh, national, uh, in inverted commas, lottery tickets. They have their own lottery tickets. Uh, there's the signature of the Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Ilonu in his letter. And uh, this carries on, and in January 1964, the Turks hardened their li line. Um, they, they, they started demanding, uh, actually demanding federation, and this carries on through 64 until, 19, uh, until July uh, when the events happen. The, the coup happens and the invasion uh, takes uh, place. And uh, before the invasion, however, there is a very significant, significant um, you know, point there, is a historical point, is that on the 17th of uh, July, 1974, when uh, Prime Minister Ejevit arrived in London and had talks, and actually he came with an entourage of officials, of military and political officials, and they had a meeting, a very lengthy meeting with Prime Minister Wilson and James Callaghan and a lot of other uh, government officials. It went up to midnight and with lunch and everything. And they agreed uh, to proceed with uh, the Turkish invasion. The British gave them their consent and uh, as long as they didn't touch the bases. And from documents I discovered later, um, Ejevit at that night also told them uh, the, the extent he, he, he planned for the uh, Attila line. The, uh, he, uh, sorry, he told them exactly um, up to where the Attila line would go. Um, perhaps they didn't take him that seriously at that time, but uh, he did. And the next day, on the 18th of July, uh, the American uh, uh, official Cisco, Joseph Cisco, arrived in, uh, in London. He was sent by uh, Foreign Secretary Dr. Henry Kissinger. And Ejevit was very explicit. The documents are very explicit in detailing everything Ejevit told Cisco. Uh, in fact, they are more explicit in, 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 in detailing what he told Cisco than what he told uh, the, the British, and they say that he asked for two, uh, conf uh, you know, conf two autonomous regions and um, separation of two communities and uh, Turkish and uh, Turkish Cypriot and Greek Cypriot under one federal umbrella, federal yes. in inverted commas, yes. of course, under federal umbrella. Yes. I mean, you described when the Turks have adopted the idea, but when did the Greeks adopt it? When did we accept it? Well, I'm very sorry to say, but the documents say that uh, our side had accepted, uh, consented to a, a, a federal uh, system before, at Geneva, before the second invasion. But... Uh, 74, you said. Yes, 74. Um, because um, 
although they didn't accept, they didn't sign anything, uh, the evidence say that uh, they, did, they had accepted uh, some sort, but they, they were reluctant to accept or sign any geographical separation uh, as such, because uh, Henry, uh, um, James Callaghan was uh, really uh, pushing uh, the Greek Cypriot representation and the Greek representation to accept geographical federation, separation, uh, uh, saying that if you don't, you know, the Turks will carry on with a second the invasion, we are not going to... Federation or separation? Uh, uh, it, it, was, it, it, is a, it is a It is a federation, Could it have yeah. been a confederation? I mean, uh, no, it wasn't a confederation at the time, no. It was a geographical separation. Two regions. Two regions. Segregated regions. Yes, in all yes, zones. yes. But very, very soon after, uh, on the 12th of uh, August 1974, uh, the Turkish uh, Foreign Secretary, Secretary Gunes proposed uh, a plan of six cantons uh, and, and, uh, covering roughly between 34 to 37 percent of the area under Turkish uh, rule. And at the same time, Rauf Dehtaj uh, proposed uh, and delivered his plan, which covered the same area but under a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation. This is important because yes. Turkey in 1974 was pressing for a cantonal arrangement. So you have pockets of Turkish Cypriots yeah. segregated from Greek Cypriots and others. But Mr. Denktash was pressing for two zones for two communities. He was That's very important. clear. Very and clear. And in, very in, clear. The, in the end, it was Mr. Denktash yeah. who, who, yeah. who won the day. Yeah. 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 Most people point to the so-called summit, uh, the summit agreements between Magarios and Denktash as the foundation of the idea of federation. Uh, is, is that held up by the evidence? No. Uh, British documents are very explicit and very clear and actually uh, topple everything that people knew so far. Uh, the 12th uh, February 1977 was not an agreement, uh, was not, uh, not even a, a press release. They were uh, um, minutes taken uh, by uh, Dr. Waldheim's uh, people, secretary, whoever, uh, and um, because Dr. Waldheim had come to Cyprus and he had a meeting with Archbishop Magarius and Rauf Dehtaj, trying to bring them together to, to, to start negotiations and, and discussions. And during that uh, meeting, minutes were taken, and during that meeting, it was agreed with a small A, and when we say agreed, it doesn't mean an agreement with capital A, uh, it was uh, agreed. Uh, that four guidelines, regulation, um, uh, instructions would be given uh, to the uh, negotiators to start the discussions. And those four guidelines, unfortunately, sometime later, for some unknown reason, and we don't know who first started this, uh, were uh, metamorphosed into uh, elevated into high-level agreements. Okay, but these, these guidelines, don't they suggest that there was a meeting of the minds, that there was a, an understanding that indeed federation was the way to go forward? It was agreed, one of the guidelines was agreed for a, a, a bicommunal federation. The word by zonal was not included. They were exploratory instructions, in other yes. words, it was, it was a... They had no binding... Uh, no, was there any consultation with the citizens of the Republic of Cyprus? No, no, no. Obviously no. no, no. This was a top-down, secretive... It was um, a meeting. It meeting. was a meeting between Waldheim, yeah. Archbishop Magarius, and Rauf Dehtaj, right. and probably a couple of uh, United Nations people who took the minutes. Did Dr. Waldheim, the then Secretary General of the United Nations, disclose that he had served in the German Wehrmacht during the Second World War? At that well, time, why no. would he? <laughs> At that did, time, did I don't he, remember. Did he make a declaration of interest that he'd served in German zones of occupation? No, but nobody. In wartime Greece and wartime Yugoslavia? No, he didn't. <laughs> oh. well, just moving on a little bit because uh, you know, time is catching up with us. Um, so, just to follow the thread, uh, Federation was an idea mm. that the, the, the Turks had. Uh, that, that served their interests 
uh, and in fact served interests more than a partition would, would do. Yes. Uh, and therefore, they continued and they systematically uh, promoted it and so on. Um, do you see anything, uh, that anything has changed today? I mean, we're in the phase of hopefully uh, negotiations that will be fruitful and that will bring a negotiated settlement and an honorable peace, uh, we're told, and, and so on, and we all hope that that will be the case. Uh, now, it has, okay, still federation is on the table, but is it the federation that, in, that brings with it the Turkish objectives, the original objectives, or is it a federation that has been uh, watered down in the minds of the Turks, uh, that they view it in a different way now. They view it as a way of compromise. Is, is today's federation a compromise, or is it a, 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 um, a throwback to the original intentions, the hardline intentions of Turkey? I think a lot of people in Cyprus would are wondering about that. You know, does this represent an, an honorable uh, compromise or, or not? No, I don't think it is. I don't think it's a, an honorable compromise. In fact, a, um, uh, it, it brings together the, the whole of the Turkish policy, which has been consistent. And uh, I am not optimistic with uh, the, the, the things are, uh, as they are going. Uh, I don't believe it will be an honorable one. Uh, Turkey will achieve everything, almost everything, because their, uh, the, the, their objective uh, is to take over uh, Cyprus, uh, and uh, they haven't got much left. Um, I believe if Turkey wants to have an honorable uh, settlement, uh, she has uh, to do a few things. And first of all, has to remove and take back her army of occupation take back all the settlers she brought in uh, on purpose to fill in the vacuum of the, uh, of the space uh, the Greek Cypriot refugees left who, who were forcibly removed and uprooted from their homes because of Turkey, and uh, allow the Greek Cypriot refugees to go back to their homes, and the Turkish Cypriots, they can come back to there. Because the only way to safeguard, I hear a lot of people uh, to, to stress the fact that we have to secure and we have to uh, respect and, and save the Republic of Cyprus. I agree absolutely, but you cannot do that. You will not do that with the Bizonal Bicommunal Federation. The only way to safeguard and uh, save the Republic of Cyprus is by a unitary state. And we need leaders to have the courage to stand up and uh, put a forward a different policy and uh, not be afraid of other uh, foreign countries being against us or not uh, uh, taking us seriously as they say. That I do not but believe. The, the counter argument is the Turks don't want that. The Turkish Cypriots will never agree to that. So, you know, it, it's, and that federation is the only way to patch things up. Uh, in fact, Hani's, uh constructive uh, ambiguities. Uh, ambiguities are all we're left with at the end of the day. We were always criticizing that, but, but in some ways, at least in one mind frame, and I'm not saying that I agree or disagree with it, but that's all you have at the end of the day. If sides, the two sides are irreconcilable, and their positions are irreconcilable, uh, the only way you can get a settlement is by papering it over. We, this is what we need to dismantle. The yeah. concept that there are two sides. Both of you, though I have enormous respect for you, of course, have fallen into the Turkish trap of using the terminology of division and partition. Well, you referred earlier to the Turkish side. Um, Fanul, I think, referred to, uh, the, referred to our side. In a liberal democracy, sure. the only right. side that exists right. is but between never, the citizen and the state. Sure. But, but nevertheless, we're in a negotiating posture. Yes. And it is their side, uh, the one side against the other side. Uh, this and is, that's the essence this, of what's wrong. This is the problem. Yeah, but, but the, I think that what, we're, what both sides are asked to do is a leap of faith. Yes. 
and a trust. Uh, they, they need to fall back on as much trust that they can uh, dredge up on on the other, having to do with the other side, and go forward with faith in the future. Now, if if I mean, what troubles me is the hidden agendas, and if uh, there is a a very strong hidden agenda on one of the sides, and I'm not saying which side, uh, it's very difficult uh, to suggest to the other side to have faith. Now, it seems to me that you're saying that the, the hidden agenda of Turkey, in fact, it's not even hidden. Uh, it's a clear agenda. It's a continuous agenda. Uh, but is, is that... Is that true? Is, is that, you know, the, the evidence that you've seen, have you seen any evidence of change have you, in this new government uh, with Ertogan, with Davut Aglu, with uh, this new sort of air going through, blowing through Turkey? Uh, is there any evidence that, you know, the, the Turks have compromised as far as we are concerned? As far I can, as only say, can only say with only a few words, no, I haven't. I haven't, and I believe the Turkish policy continues as it was. Um, they haven't changed. In fact, they may have hardened their line. And we don't know what will happen uh, in a few months in Turkey. Uh, politics is, is, is a game. You, you can never say no, uh, never to politics, of course. But uh, I hope they change. But it's something I will... It will take a lot to persuade me that Turkey will change their policy. Uh, once they reach this point. I know that it's a difficult dilemma, especially for, for the Greeks. Yeah, for the Greeks, uh, I will use the Greek Cypriot side, but uh, uh, it's difficult. And I believe with, uh, if, if we insist uh, uh, in, in establishing a bizonal bicommunal federation, uh, it will not last uh, very long. It will uh, collapse. And I believe, unfortunately, that will be the end of Greek uh, people in, in Cyprus. Is there any optimistic point that we could end? <laughs> yes, yes. We have to go back to liberal <laughs> democracy and the rule of law. Yeah. Everybody, irrespective of race or religion, should be treated equally. Everybody should be treated with respect, and the democracy should be built from the bottom up. The secrecy and the... Uh, procedural unfairness that is on display in Nicosia has to come to an end. We need to have a bottom-up, transparent process which involves consultation with the citizens and other lawful residents of the Republic of Cyprus. We need to dismantle bicommunalism and have the principle of equality under the law as the founding principle of the Constitution. We must dismantle the concept of two zones and have a unitary state in which everybody is in, in permitted to live wherever they wish, provided they're a citizen of the Republic of Cyprus or of the European Union. The settlers and colonists must uh, be returned humanely and according to the principles of due process. So there will be exceptions to the general uh, principle. And the Turkish troops must leave, and the murderers of the past and the criminals of the past must be brought to justice in accordance with the principles of due process. That's my view, and it doesn't matter whether the alleged perpetrators were Greeks, Greek Cypriots, Turks, or Turkish Cypriots, or others. Whoever. They should be brought to justice, and a um, war crimes tribunal, an ad hoc war crimes tribunal should be established, or if Turkey ratifies the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court, perhaps the, the International Criminal Court might be used, or, or, an, or an ad hoc version of it. So th we need to be optimistic here. A tall order. Though. It is a tall order, <laughs> but changes happen yeah. when there is political leadership, yes. when there is drive, and when we learn the lessons of history. And the lessons of history have been played out for I us today. The last word is, uh, I don't like people saying that, but Turkey will not accept this, but Turkey will not do this. Why should we continue accepting what, accepting what Turks say? I mean, haven't we got a voice of our own to insist and go to Europe, go to the United Nations, like the other day? I will say this. The, the other day I saw the president of the Republic of Cyprus, a president of a, 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 a occupied Cyprus, and he... Instead of saying all those things he said, he should have said three clear things. 
I came in front of you today, in front of the world, and I ask you three things. My country is occupied. Help me liberate my country, Turkey to take her troops out, take the settlers out, and allow our, my people to go back to their homes. What uh, better, clear message could a president of an occupied country give to the world if he had said these three things and said thank you and sit down? I hope he's watching. I hope he does. <laughs> and with that, thank you, uh, dear Hanula. This was, uh, thank you for your time. And thank you for was, inviting me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and all of you, thank you for uh, being with us. Uh, hope to see you next time. Goodbye.